honor and pleasure to introduce Marcus Hutter to you, who is a professor in the Research School of Computer Science at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, before this, he was at ITSIA, the Swiss AI lab in Lugano in Switzerland, and at NICTA at the National ICT of Australia in Sydney, where I think you were working in at Canberra. Canberra. Also. It's in Canberra? Okay. It's everywhere, so it's a Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane. So. Ah, okay. Where well, you were working in the machine learning group? Yep. Um, Marcus' research is centered around many things, but especially universal artificial intelligence, which is a mathematical top down approach to AI related to cosmograph complexity, algorithmic probability, universal Solomonoff induction, Occam's razor, sequential decision theory, dynamic programming, reinforcement learning, and rational agents, of which I guess quite a share will probably come up in your talk as well. Um, a part of this, Marcus has numerous publications and conferences and journals where I'm honestly impressed by the different, say, fields you've published in. So it ranges from AI over philosophy, physics, biostatistics and bioinformatics and quite some others. He was editor of several books and of the proceedings of AGI conferences. He's the author of Universal Artificial Intelligence, Sequential Decisions Based on Algorithmic Probability, the UAI book. And he has at least one patent, I think. So that's the book. And he has at least one patent on system and method for analyzing and displaying two or three dimensional sets of data. Yeah, Marcus, stage the yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation here to talk here. Um, luckily, the workshop is not just called creativity, but creativity and general intelligence. And I think I will cover the general intelligence part, um, hopefully um, quite well. Um, but I have also one slide about creativity, so um, um, at the very end. <coughs> because, I mean, if you claim to have a system which is general intelligent, then of course it must be creative also, because that is a significant part of intelligence. So I have um, some things to do. Okay, um, so this title is um, The Theory of Universal Artificial Intelligence is hard in the sense that it's quite mathematical, but I don't want to talk too much about the mathematics, but more about the soft aspects, and I mean with that sort of the social aspects um, and philosophical aspects, okay? And um, I mean, creativity is one of them, maybe the more soft aspects. Okay, first I will um, talk about some preliminaries. Um, then the universal artificial intelligence model, and um, a lot of time I will spend on discussing these things. And um, please interrupt me any time, I have a whole hour, um, so that should be sufficient. I try to be rather quick with the first part, um, so that we have more time for the discussion. So first I want to ask, um, who knows the IXI model or the universal AI model? Okay, good. Who does not know it? Okay, so for one half it will be too slow and for the other half it will be too fast. Yeah? Okay, and maybe there are one or two guys which are, for which it fits. Okay, so um, first to set the stage, what is intelligence? What is artificial intelligence? And if you look at it, um, intelligence can have many traits and here sort of I made this list here. Um, intelligence associated with reasoning, creativity, association, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, Blah, 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 and so on. So this, this is potentially infinitely long. Yeah. Um, so um, this indicates that um, quantifying, formalizing intelligence may be a hard task. Um, so what we did a couple of years ago, we went through the philosophy, um, psychology, and AI literature and looked for um, definitions of intelligence um, among individual researchers and sort of group consensus group definitions. So this web takes there all these definitions. And it is, I mean, they are very diverse, but there is also a common theme, and are, we have distilled one definition out of it, which seems to capture most, if not all, of at least rational intelligence. Okay. Um, another indication why intelligence um, is complicated, because the real world is nasty. Yeah. I, I don't want to call it complex, and it is complicated in one sense. I mean, look at all the rich structures out there. On the other hand, it's quite simple. I mean, the standard model of particle physics plus general relativity captures our universe quite well, and these are just a couple of equations. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to say whether it's simple or complex. It's like with fractals. I mean, if you look at a fractal, it's something very structured, very complex, but the underlying equation is very simple. 
But in any case, the world is nasty. Um, so what I mean with it, it is partially observable or partially unobservable. So if I play chess, I know, look at the board currently, that means I know everything I need to know. But the world is not like that. I don't see what is behind me, okay? Which can be very important. You know, maybe there's a tiger there. Huh? Well, it's unlikely here, but in earlier times, okay? Um, so um, we don't have perfect knowledge of the world. Um, partly because it's partially observable, partly because we don't know the initial state of the world. Then um, it is um, also stochastic, at least current physics says um, there's true randomness in the world. This is something very important. The world is non ergodic or in less technical words, um, you cannot recover from all errors you do. So you make one wrong turn with your car and you know you maybe lose your arm or something like that, or kill a person you have to pay the rest of your life. Or um, you fail the third time the final exam in university, uh, you never get the job you wanted to have. Yeah? So um, this makes AI in practice, also in AI in theory, very, very difficult. Um, the world is reactive. It's not like weather prediction. I predict whether it's sun or rain, and that's it. The weather doesn't care. Um, but um, when I do something, the world can react back to me. So if I play chess, my opponent does something back to me. Or if I drive my car, turn left, I see something suddenly completely different. Okay, and um, it, it's very big, this world, but luckily it's structured, and that is what you can exploit in designing AI systems. Um, there's another table uh, I want to briefly um, mention uh, because I only concentrate on the right corner. So intelligence is sometimes associated with thinking, sometimes with acting, sometimes it's associated with what humans do, and sometimes with what rational, what rationality is. And now you have here these four boxes, and um, cognitive science, for instance, is about human thinking. Uh, behaviorism is about human acting. I mean, it's a little bit simplifying, but essentially that's true. And um, say the laws of thought, logic, you know, Aristotle, and so on, um, is about rational thinking. Um, but most of AI, and also I will talk about um, the right lower corner, about agents which act rationally. So what's the right thing to do? And I only care indirectly on how the agent thinks, if there were a big lookup table which produces a human level AI, I wouldn't care, right? That's fine for me. Okay? I mean, that's not going to happen, but um, whether it's a neural net yeah, or um, some compression algorithm or some chips, um, as long as the behavior is fine, um, I'm happy. Okay? So I will only talk about this corner. Um, AI has connections to many fields and universal AI um, also. I just want to quickly go through the list. Um, and I will touch many of them. So clearly, but you know, maybe that's not the best thing that computer that AI is sort of within computer science. I come back to that if I have time. Um, and machine learning. So these are the two um, important subfields of computer science dealing with um, AI-ish questions. Then from engineering, we have the concept of information theory. Uh, you could ask, you know, why is this in engineering? Well, it's an historical artifact, maybe, right? But I mean, it is fact, yeah. Of course, computer scientists also do information theory, but usually we hear like adaptive control theory. Or, I mean, the rational agent concept or game theory. It's sort of interesting. Why is game theory in economics while minimax games, which is a very special kind of game, is in computer science? Okay. Um, then I need a lot of mathematics, which I try to suppress as far as possible, mainly statistics and probability to deal with the uncertainty. And there are various concepts on psychology, like behaviorism, motivation, incentives, which of course sort of influence the fields back and forth. And philosophy, um, I mean, AI has many connections to philosophical questions, like, I mean, the induction problem is big, um, what is reasoning, what is knowledge. I mean, you have these philosophical definitions like justified truth, belief, and then you can sort of compare that to what, say, AI people believe about knowledge. Okay, um, next question is, can intelligence be formulated in very simple terms? And most people believe, no, that can't be the case. I mean, intelligence is such a complex phenomenon, you can't press that in a simple equation. Um, well, I will do that in a second, but I will give you sort of even before um, some motivation why that could be possible. And that is maybe the reason why I even tried. So, if you look at cellular automata, I mean, you all know Game of Life of Conway, or maybe from Stephen Wolfram, the one-dimensional 110 rule, they're Turing complete. That means these very simple systems 
can exhibit arbitrarily complex phenomena, everything which you can do with a general purpose computer. Okay. Um, I mentioned already fractals here, z equals z squared plus c. You iterate it, you get these Mandelbrot sets, these beautiful things. Uh, very simple equation gives you chaos and order. Or even more impressive, quantum and electrodynamics. This theory describes, in principle, all chemical processes. And that's a very rich um, field. Um, and maybe superstring theory describes the whole universe, we don't know yet. Yeah. So, um, there, so the point is there are many simple systems and equations which describe very rich structures. And well, intelligence is also a complex phenomenon, but well, the universe is also complex. And maybe you know, it's not clear whether the human brain is something more complex than the universe or maybe something simpler. So in any case, um, a priori, um, it is not provably sort of impossible that there's a simple theory which describes superintelligence. And I will present this theory. Okay, now. So please interrupt me if you have any comments or questions. Okay, um, I um, consider the general agent framework. I did it in the classical textbook, so an agent which acts, so these actions, the environment then can react back to the agent and the agent observes something new and occasionally you give the agent reward. I mean here reward every time step so it could be zero all the time and except if you win or lose a game you get plus or minus one. Um, or if you're a household robot you just you know, reward it and punish it um, whenever you feel like it, um, like you do with your dog. Okay? Um, so that's the general um, AI framework with reinforcement. So that is what is done in reinforcement learning. But in reinforcement learning, usually you go immediately to rather simple systems like finite state spaces, the MDPs, and then of course you try to generalize that, but it's from the very beginning limited. And well, I want to show a general AI system, so that is not very useful. Um, control theory, adaptive control theory, does very similar things on an abstract level. But well, then in practice, you go immediately to linear systems with quadratic loss functions as a basis, and then you get Riccati equations, and Kalman filters, and all these things. Um, and then people, of course, they always try to generalize that and pushing the boundaries. But I mean, a linear system is very far away from real life, right? OK. So what can you do? Um, so this is an ultra compact slide of the philosophical and technical ingredients into universal AI. So most importantly, we need Occam's razor. Um, you will know that, I don't have to talk about that. Um, but we also need Epicurus principle, which says, if I have multiple explanations, keep all of them. And that seems to contradict Occam's razor, which tells to keep the simplest explanation. So we have to unify that somehow. And the compromise is, yes, I keep all explanations, but I have some bias towards simplicity. Okay. So these are philosophical principles, and we need to quantify them. Um, next, what I need is, if an agent has some beliefs and gets new observations, new data, it needs to update the beliefs. And base rule is a perfect vehicle to do that. Um, you just take your prior belief, multiply with the likelihood, and then you get the posterior apart from a factor. Okay, that is fine. But base does not tell you how to choose the prior. And that is very important to have that too. I mean, we want to jumpstart the robot somehow. Um, so now we go back to Occam's Ray and Ethical's principle that you should have a bias towards simplicity. But first we need to formalize that. And um, I need the concept of Turing machines, interesting not for computational purposes in a, in a, in a strict sense, um, but for defining what complexity means. Um, and I do that with Kolmogorov complexity. Um, Kolmogorov complexity um, says that the information content in some object, think about a binary string, is the shortest program which, if you run it on a universal Turing machine, reproduces your object. So if you have a sequence of one million ones, well, there's a very short program which produces the sequence, so the information content is very little. If it's a sequence of pi, well, it's a little bit more tricky. My program is a little bit longer, yeah, but it's still finite, the information content, even if I have a billion or so um, digits of pi. But if, say, I ever take, say, a movie of this talk, then well, hopefully the information content is a little bit larger um, and um, it is much harder to find a short program and to represent it. I mean, of course, you know, there's a lot of redundancy in these slides and um, we all know how to compress things. Okay, and um, so information content can be measured by description length, but now we have to choose a description language and the most general universal language is um, a program on a universal language. Okay. 
So now we have a notion of complexity of strings and general objects, which we can use as um, complexity of hypothesis also. Okay. And so Lomonov put everything together, and he said, well, our prior belief in a hypothesis should be 2 to the minus the Kolmogorov complexity of this hypothesis. And now we have everything, right? We have our prior. Um, I haven't talked about the model class. The model class should be naturally the class of all computable hypotheses because it's not computable. It will be sort of 2 to the minus infinity, 0. And um, to make it smaller sort of would be restrictive. Okay. And then we have base rule to update things. And um, you can show that everything is fine. But one thing is still missing. You can do predictions. You can, you know, you can compute the posterior or predictive distributions, but we want an agent which acts, and the world reacts back to that. And for that, we need one thing more, and um, that is, well, in mathematics, it's called, or well, in statistics, sequential decision theory. Um, in um, if it's a deterministic system in AI, it's called AI planning. Um, in control theory, it's called well, um, control theory. So in engineering, it's called control theory. Um, so Bellman equations were also originally <coughs> from control engineers. So um, this is a theory which tells us if we have a perfect or sufficiently good model of the world, how to do optimal actions. And in the simplest case of chess, I mean, we know if you play minimax to the end of the game, that's optimal. And in more general worlds, if I have a stochastic description of my world, I just do expectimax to say, the death of the agent, and that is optimal. Okay. But we don't know the world, right? So what do we do? Well, we have here an induction scheme which works very well for unknown worlds. Maybe we should replace the true distribution in the Bellman equations by this universal distribution. And then we get the best of both worlds. An agent which acts optimal in arbitrary unknown worlds, and if you think about that, that looks like pretty close to what the general intelligence system should do. And that's what I will present you now. Okay? Um, actually, in two slides. Before I go to that, I want to... I could present the equation immediately, uh, but I want to derive it um, in a different way. I could derive it according to this scheme here, but I want to derive it differently. And it would be very nice if we had a notion a formal measure of intelligence. And if this measure is general, universal, good enough, then I just look for the agent which has maximal intelligence with respect to this measure. And well, by definition, it's the maximal intelligent agent then. Okay? So if I solve the problem of um, formally defining intelligence, I at least formally have also solved the problem of um, having an AGI. Okay, let's do that. Um, if you remember this picture of the agent environment, so here formally an agent follow some policy, so he sees some action observation reward sequence in the past, and he somehow reacts to it and gives some action. Okay? And the environment, um, dually, um, sees also, I mean, the whole history, in principle at least, you know, the last action of the agent, and then provides new observation and new reward. Okay? And then the cycle continues. And the weekly means that it could be a stochastic policy or stochastic environment. And so they interact with each other, and they produce a reward sequence. I mean, also an observation action sequence, but I care about the reward sequence. And a natural notion of performance is um, the total reward you accum accumulate. Okay? If it's stochastic, you have to take the expectation. And so the value of policy pi in environment mu is defined at this one here. So that's pretty standard in reinforcement learning. Um, except that usually you start with an MDP and then you write down the be recursive Bellman equations, which I can't do because I want a general system and our world is not a mark of decision process. Okay. So that is completely arbitrary. Everything can depend on the whole history. I mean, if you think about physics, physics seems to be a first order mark of process um, over state space or a second order mark of process over just um, the locations of particles. I mean, simple terms. Um, that would be if the world were completely observable. But as soon as you have partial observability, um, the observation function itself can also depend on things which are very much in the past. You know, I observed something three days ago, and this may affect sort of the future. Okay. So, so far so good, but that evaluates agent pi in a particular environment, mu. And of course, we don't know what the true world is like. So what we have to do is, 
um, we have to average over a wide range of environments, namely all environments which potentially could be true. And how do we average? Well, we have to have a weighted average because they're infinitely many. And how do we weight? Well, we should use Occam's razor and Apico's principle. We should have a bias towards simpler environments. So a priori, we should believe the world is simple unless experience tells us it can't be that simple. So I take, I mean, this is again the definition of Kolmogorov complexity. And now I just take a weighted average over these values, over all kinds of environments mu. Formally, it's all semi-computable, semi-probability distribution, but if you drop the word semi, it makes sense to you. Um, and it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, so, and you could regard this, yeah, or it is the average performance of a policy pi averaged over a huge class of environments. And I claim that this is a very good notion of measuring the intelligence of an agent. Okay. And if I compare that to um, the informal definition, which um, remember the, the 70 definitions, and we assembled sort of one um, combined one. And the informal definition says intelligence measures an agent's ability to perform well in a wide range of environments. I mean, these are a lot of words, but later, if I show you the equation, you see how it nicely fits to the equation. Um, but even here already, um, you see that it nicely coincides with the equation. So, intelligence measures an agent ability. So ability means the agent may fail, just an expectation of it, some probability should succeed. So here you have these expectations. And it should perform well, and the perform well is measured by reward sum, and in a wide range of environments means all computable environments. So that captures quite well this informal notion. So if you have tools with this definition, I mean, we can come back to that later, but um, I will argue that is at least the best informal definition of intelligence I know of. Okay. And now we have this measure. Then just take the art marks over all policies, which gives us the most intelligent agent. Right, very simple. Problem solved. Okay, so that's the super intelligence we are all looking for. Yeah, unfortunately, um, there's some computational problems here. Um, I will not talk too much about them, but a little bit later. Okay, so why is this intelligence measure I've just presented um, any good or could be any good. So first, it captures the informal definition, which I just presented. It incorporates Occam's razor, and um, it is very general. So it does not. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just uh, confused about uh, using the agent and using the agent as a policy. Yeah, the agent and the policy it's the same thing. It's the same. Yes. So the agent is assumed not to change the policy ever. No, it, this policy can be a non-stationary policy. A policy is just some function of the history to the next action, but the history gets longer and longer, right? If I have seen 20 bits, I do A, but if I have seen 21 bits, I do B. That's perfectly fine, that's also policy. This is a string of action, observation. Yes, this is the star means the, the whole past string. Yeah. I mean, classically in RL you have a policy which is a function of the state, and then a fixed policy would be too restricted, it would not change. But this can change arbitrarily in principle. I mean, it doesn't change, it is. So every time you, you perform an, an, an action which can be an arbitrary function of the history, right? Okay. So, and yes, I mean, real agents have non stationary policies. And uh, it, it's some, some matter of terminology whether non stationary policy is that a, a changing stationary policy or is it the same object, but technically it doesn't make a difference. Okay, um, so I was here. So I can measure the intelligence of an agent, whatever the internal workings is, whether it's a neural network um, or some um, symbolic AI. Um, I just plug that in and measure the average performance of all these environments, at least in principle. Um, then what we did, we constructed some simple agents or an agent which just you know, does random actions or um, plays tic-tac-toe well. So some very simple things and you have an intuitive order, you know, this is, I mean, a random agent is pretty stupid, an agent which plays tic-tac-toe well is smarter, right? And you have an intuitive order, and um, if you compute this order, I mean, you approximate that, um, it, you, give, you get the same order. So it's um, consistent, um, at least for simple agents. And um, I have shown that this IXC agent, which maximizes the intelligence measure, is extremely powerful. So at least the top end of this measure um, captures um, super intelligence well. Um, also, compared to the Turing test, I mean, if you, if you try a mouse 
solving the Turing test, I mean, it will fail miserable. Yeah. So it, it's quite binary, right? It's it's apart from the other problems. Um, but here it is very large range. Yeah. So I mean, you can compare a random agent to an agent which just plays tic tac toe well, the chess agent, car driving agent, human level, superhuman. So it has a very wide span, which is very good. Um, it's also practical and meaningful in the sense that it's not some abstract notion of intelligence which is in a sense arguable whether this intelligence at all or what does it mean it is practical intelligence in the sense that the agent does something it solves problems it collects reward yeah. okay, it's not just deliberating abstractly like a philosopher and maybe you know never coming up with something I mean he can be very intelligent right yeah but that's maybe not the intelligence we um, expect from agents. Um, it's also non-anthropocentric, so if you again compare it to the Turing test, um, there's a human in the loop, right? A human, I mean, there's the, the interrogator and, and the, the person who judges, so they're two humans. So you can never make the Turing test formal, so formalize it mathematically and then use that um, for designing agents. And here there's no human in the loop, okay, which is good. Um, so it's simple and intuitive formal definition. So it does not rely on equally hard notions such as, I mean, humans, it, which would be the worst case, or even creativity. I mean, you find many definitions sort of which uh, intelligence um, is being creative, blah, 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 or something. But then you have the problem of creativity. Yeah. So I reverse that. Now what I have to show, of course, how is creativity built into these agents, right? If I don't start with it, then my, I think, last slide is about that. Okay, so that is hopefully a quick motivation why this is a good measure of intelligence. And now let's get back to, to, to this rather abstract definition of the IC model, this super intelligence. And I can give you a more explicit definition, um, which is this one here, um, which looks a little bit more complicated. But given that it captures super intelligence, um, it is rather simple. So super intelligence in one line um, is, I think, quite nice. Yeah. Um, so the standard model of particle physics is a little bit longer, even I think, yeah, depending how you write it down. Okay. So what does it mean all here? Um, first, if you know chess, the minimax strategy. Now we don't have an adversarial, but we have a stochastic world. We have expectimax. This is exactly this one here. Okay. So it times that k the agent tries to maximize his action, but then he has to average over the reactions, potential reactions of the world, which is this sum here, I come to the probability in a second. And this stops means that it's AK, AK plus one, AK plus two, and so on. And I mean, you could draw that as a tree, you have max, sum, max, sum, max, sum. And what is the goal? The goal is to maximize um, total reward from cycle K to say M where the agent dies. I mean, the real model then has discounting and infinite horizon, whatever. So the tricky part is, um, if the world is stochastic, what probability distribution to choose? Well, if you we knew it, it would choose, of course, the true one, but we don't know it. Then we use this universal distribution, um, which Solomonov invented, uh, slightly um, extended to deal with actions, and this is this one here. And there are various ways to explain that, and this is and to express that, and this is one way. So look at it the following. I look at all world models P, I mean, these are programs or world models or hypotheses, it's all the same thing, which are consistent with what I know. Okay? I'm at cycle K, or I means IC. Um, the IC has observed a lot of things, has acted, and now IC say, well, maybe the world is P. So then if you run P on, on a universal Turing machine and it reproduces the past, then it's a valid hypothesis, it's consistent with my observations. If it's not, we know it's wrong, so we can rule it out. So we only have to consider the p which are consistent with the history, but then there are many. And again, Occam tells us to take the simplest one, which is a, actually a very good approximation, so you could do that. Um, but Epicurus tells us keep all of them, and the compromise is we take a weighted average and we weigh them by 2 to the minus their length. We could also use two, the Kolmogorov complex, it doesn't make a difference here. Okay? Or from a more Bayesian perspective, maybe um, you say, well, the world is a computable probability distribution, and I want to take a Bayesian mixture of all computable probability distribution. You can do that too. That's indeed technically more useful, but you can indeed show that both definitions are equivalent. Intuitively, the reason is that the stochastic worlds are in the convex hull of the deterministic ones, and if I mix over the deterministic ones, I capture the stochastic ones anyway. 
So, um, so that is, I mean, maybe not the most useful representation, but at least it's the most compact one. And the most compact one, which is explicit. I mean, the previous one was very abstract. And the only thing which is not explicit is what is the Turing machine. I mean, the universal Turing machine is not a too simple concept, and I haven't written that down. That is sort of, this is the only thing I hide here. And maybe the observation, re reward, and action spaces, but that doesn't really matter. You can use, if you're minimalist, just use binary spaces. If you're more practically oriented, choose you know, your camera image and your usual actuators. Um, it doesn't make any difference. You can show that. Okay. And um, given the motivation slides, the three slides before, from the definition of intelligence and, uh, um, and its ingredients, it is plausible that this is the most intelligent agent. And indeed, you can um, prove that. Um, you can find these proofs in my papers, in my book. Yeah? I'm sorry, maybe what I'm going to say makes nothing uh, nonsense at all, but the, the summation over all whatever things are taking uh, should converge, right? In a mathematical sense. I mean, if, if, if it exists, then we can do the summation. Otherwise, mathematically, it's not possible to sum over all things that are infinite. It must, it must mathematically converge, that is right, and it does. Uh, so, um, so, I mean, there's a technicality. These are so-called, um, well, sloppily speaking, prefix-free programs, um, or actually there are minimal programs on a so-called monotone Turing machine. There are lots of technicalities. And then you can show that this sum over 2 to the minus length of p, even if you sum over all programs, this is finite. But, but what about now? Action, observation, rewards, all of them. Uh, are they ah, this one here. Yeah, yeah, because this is a proper probability distribution over observation rewards mm -hmm. given actions. And we all know that the probability distribution, if we sum over the random variable, it sums to 1, right? And that's also the case here. So these sums here, yes, I mean, it is not only does it sum to some finite value, but this sum plus this sum plus this sum, all these sums together gives you something which is more equal than 1. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, you, you have to be careful to choose the right type of universal Turing machine. Normal Turing machine just holds and has blank symbols. This has no blank symbols. These are monotone programs which just run forever, you know, like a streaming process, you know. And so there are lots of technicalities, but yes, that is no problem. There would be a problem if M, if I say the agent lives forever. If I let M to infinity, then I get problems. And I either used to have discounting, but then there are other kinds of problems, so you have to be careful there. Yeah. But yes, it needs to sum to something finite, and it does. Okay, so um, that sort of ends the formal part, it was not too formal anyway, right? Um, part of the lecture, and now I want to discuss this model. Okay, so first, let's see intuitively what this model does in various generic problem classes. So the first thing is, I told you that Solomonov induction is, in a sense, the best way um, to solve the prediction problem, so no other, prediction, no other predictor can perform better, roughly speaking. So if I use this IC model, which is an agent which acts, not just predicts, but if I use the agent for prediction, the question is what happens. And indeed, what you can show is that this age is also a good predictor. This is not too surprising since it's a combination of Solomonov plus sequential decision making. If you just want to do prediction, it should um, do prediction well, but indeed the proofs are not so trivial. Yeah. Okay. Um, say more interesting, let's, let's use IC for playing a game like chess. Um, and let's give very, very weak feedback. So only at the end of the game, you reward if it wins the game or loses, uh, or minus one if it loses the game. I mean, no one, no real person would learn chess like that, but let's try it. And indeed, Ixi will learn very, very quickly to play chess. Quickly in terms of data efficiency, how many games it has to play. Because what happens is the following. If you make a move, and this will be an illegal move, usually, right? Because it doesn't even know the rules of the game. It doesn't know anything, okay? So, Making an illegal move means losing the game, okay? So it will get mean of minus one. Next game, minus one, minus one, minus one. But there's some chance, maybe 5% or so, I have calculated it, that accidentally you do the correct move, some of these correct moves. 
This gives you reward zero, and then it will likely make an illegal move. Okay? So well, so now I've delayed my minus one reward by a little bit. So it will learn to avoid illegal moves, which is quite good. Right? Okay, so now it will make only legal moves. I mean, there's some tricky things like hustling or so with Kaloma to learn. Okay, so now it will make legal moves, but of course it will still lose. Next, um, if sometimes some games will be a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, right? And um, of course, the shorter the game, the more games you play, and the, the more often you see a minus one. So playing a long game and losing is better than playing a short game and losing, because you get less often a minus one at the end. And when does it take longer to lose a game? Well, say, if, say, I mean, a natural first measure is the number of pieces you have minus the number of pieces my opponent has. Yeah? If that number is larger, usually you survive for longer. So it will um, realize that there's a positive correlation between pieces I have and time it takes to lose the game. And um, how does that work? That is all done by Kolmogorov complexity. Kolmogorov complexity is really magical, and I don't have time to explain that. But whenever there is a regularity structure or something in your data, Kolmogorov complexity will find that. Okay? So then it will realize number of pieces is correlated to how long it takes to lose, so it will try to not lose its pieces, which is quite a good strategy. And then it will run more sophisticated um, heuristics in chess. And at some point, it will maybe you know able to not lose for 50 moves against Kasparov or something like that, and that is quite a pretty good achievement. And maybe then accidentally it will also win a game, and then it will learn the concept of what winning a game means. Or maybe by symmetry, because the game is symmetric, right? It loses a lot, so it knows what losing means, and maybe it realizes the symmetry in the game, it knows what winning means. Okay. And, um, yeah, so what you, I mean, this is a lot of blah blah here, but um, many things have been proven, not everything. But what you can show here for games, for instance, I mean, Ixe does not assume or know that your opponent is an optimal minimax player, which is not even true, right? It's just an assumption, which is good enough for these games. Um, but what you can show is that if your game is a zero sum minimax game and your opponent plays optimal minimax, then this expected max sequence you have seen here converges actually to a minimax, right? And it must be, because if it wouldn't, it would not play optimal chess, and there would be some defect, and that can't be general intelligence. So what happens is this probability distribution will concentrate on the single true distribution, which is the distribution which um, captures the rules of chess and that my opponent is minimax. That leaves only one reaction of the world, and, um, um, and then all these sums um, collapse to a single contribution, which is just the minimizing contribution. And you can show that. Um, another important problem is um, optimization. So function optimization is interestingly much harder than prediction, generically, because in prediction I can I don't have to plan ahead. But if I want to optimize a function, there's always the question: Should I probe next time at the place where I believe the maximum is, or should I explore this function a little bit more in order to learn more and then get a better feeling where the maximum is? So you already have the exploration exploitation problem. And but what you can show is, in the special case of function optimization, that this exploration and exploitation is indeed done by Ix. Okay? Um, another interesting question is supervised learning. I mean, we saw that Ix can learn to play chess, um, and in this case it worked, but in general, if you're able to listen to a teacher, um, you learn usually much faster than just with a carrot and a stick. Right? And, but Ix is designed to be a reinforcement learner. It's not designed to listen to a teacher. So what I have to show is that it will learn to listen to a teacher. Otherwise, it will be not. Um, it will have some defects, right? And indeed, you can show that. So what happens here is that supervised problems can be broken up into two parts. One part is to, I mean, this is for instance a classification problem set as a feature vector, and this is a class label to understand the relation between feature vector and class label which is more or less a compression task. Find a simple relation between input and output variables, okay? And then it's done automatically by IXE because it wants to compress everything. That's fine. But nobody has told IXE, yeah, to then predict the correct label. Yeah? Um, whether it predicts the correct or wrong label, the compression doesn't care about that. Yeah? But once you have learned 
the input-output behavior, it's a very simple task to learn to predict the correct label. So the only thing you have to learn is, oh, use this model and, you, and base your action on it. And however complex your supervised learning problem, this problem of learning to listen to this teacher is a problem I say is of size order one, right? It has nothing to do with the complex underlying problem. So it's in a sense a simple problem. And um, you can show that simple problems, well, can be learned fast by AXI. So if we learn this simple problem fast in the traditional reinforcement learning style, and then it has learned to listen to the teacher and then it can learn sort of faster. Um, so, so these are all indications that nothing is missing in AXI. But as I presented at the beginning, you have this long list of traits of intelligence. So I to go through all of them, and I will do that, and I will take till 6 p.m. <laughs> uh, I will only mention some of them. Okay, um, <coughs> I guess I skip over that. So, I mean, this is an abstract model. Um, this one is intractable; it's exponentially in the horizon, and this is principally incomputable. Yeah? So, um, we have big problems here. But what you do is, um, in practice, you approximate that, and we have developed various approximations. Some more theoretically, um, some more theoretical approximations, which give you a computable agent, which has still universality properties and strong, theor um, strong theorems, but which still not run on a real computer because of huge multiplicative constants. I mean, it's computable but ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, but Jürgen did something with his Lemmy search kind of search, so he, he he made it work, but not yet for I. Okay. But um, that gives some hope. And then um, we have developed various practical approximations um, like this MCIC CDW and the Phi MDP. And these are two latest ones. I present just some results of this one here. What we did here is the expected max we solved by Monte Carlo. It's not as simple. Um, so what we took there some recent ideas from Computer Go. So the upper confidence bound for tree search algorithm and uh, so-called playout policy which has nice theoretical guarantees and works very well in practice on computer goals. So we just stole that and applied it to the expected max search. And for the Solomonov mixture, we replaced this huge class by um, the so-called class of variable order um, suffix trees, which is like here, Markov, but the k can vary depending on context. That's a class which has double exponential size, so a two to the power, two to the power of k, um, environments in this class, but you can compute it in linear time. Okay, so and then you can run that, and here are several toy examples, like the typical AI four by four grid and Tiger and so on, and some more real games like tic tac toe, um, very primitive poker version, and Pac-Man. And so this is the experience, the cycle. So this is K, and this is the um, achieved reward, and we normalize that to one. So one is the maximum you can achieve. And you see, for all games, IC learns um, to play optimally. Um, it learns to play Pac-Man, um, but not um, perfect. I have a video which I could present um, at the end if I have time. Um, okay. So what is great here? I mean. We are not at chess yet, and so what that chess program. So, so, so why is this great here? Um, there's a single agent, the same architecture, no adaptation. Just you interface it with different problems. You don't even tell it the rules of the game, and it's able to learn the rules of the game and then play well. It's the same agent learning to play Pac-Man and tic-tac-toe, and the first agent which can do that. And that's what general intelligence is about, right? To be general, to be able to learn everything. Um, so here is the promised long list of aspects of intelligence again, and now I could go through this long list and argue um, how um, these traits of intelligence are incorporated in the IXI model. It will take a long time. So, I mean, some of them are obviously um, like, for instance, memorization. I mean, IXI stores the whole history, so um, this is definitely explicitly built in. The planning is in the expected max tree. So some things are built in explicitly. Others, um, like, um, say, um, let's take, well, the reasoning. Where's the reasoning going on? Okay. 
Okay, the reasoning is implicit mostly in the compression. So it tries to, or it needs to find the shortest program consistent with observations. And well, abstractly, it's just, you know, this mathematical equation, but in practice, you have to provide a lot of modules which interpret your data, relate things to each other, um, represent the knowledge in um, more abstract form. There's some uh, knowledge representation, hopefully, should be somewhere here. Um, and all these things appear um, in the compression part. Okay. Uh, creativity, I have an extra slide on that. I'll, I'll skip that. And then there are more these interface skills like visual language and motor skills. In, um, in theory, you can just interface IC with the raw sensory input, raw output, and it would work. In practice, what you, what you have to do is um, do some vision pre-processing. Yeah. So these non-universal kinds of algorithms, um, which you know, maybe up to sort of object recognition, but maybe only to lower levels. In the same language, maybe you convert, you know, raw wave file into um, into um, some, you know, wave -like compression, or, or maybe you do the speech recognition, which works quite well nowadays, right? And transcribe it and then give it to the input system. And the same with more skills. I mean, you can higher level uh, levels. So in, in theory, you can plug it to the raw input output. In practice, you would have modules, special modules for that to make the task for the core. <laughs> okay, um, and then of course there are other aspects of the human mind, like consciousness, self-awareness, sentience, emotions, and so on. Um, I put them on these slides because it is not so clear how relevant they are for a rational agent. So I'm not, as you remember from this box, I'm not so interested in building a human agent, but more a rational agent, a rational intelligent agent. And um, but my point is, if some of these qualia are relevant for rational decision making, then there will be, and there should be, emergent traits of RxC2. Well, that's a claim and you could argue for it. Um, I mean, the hard part would be to formalize that mathematically somehow and prove something about that. I mean, we got quite far. I have another slide which is sort of maybe somewhere in between, but at the moment we haven't formalized what well, self-awareness is. Maybe that's the easiest one. I mean, it's still hard, yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's a hard problem of consciousness. You know, maybe these robots are just zombies which behave like having consciousness or not. Um, I believe um, we don't have to uh, care about this question. We just build these rational agents. At some point, they will behave on a human level, and then we will ascribe them consciousness, whether they are or not. We don't know. I mean, I also don't know whether you are zombies, right? Just polite to assume that you're not. Okay. And these are philosophical zombies, yeah, not the movie zombies, right? I mean, if you don't, I mean, these philosophical zombies behave indistinguishable from real humans, yeah, but they just don't have any experience. They just pretend. Okay. Um, okay. Um, a big question, if which I often hear, is where do the rewards come from? Um, well, if you want a household robot which is useful to you, I mean, or even you know, a research assistant, or even something higher, say, you know, President of the United States, doesn't really matter. Um, you just interact with the system and give it reward like a child, yeah, and then it learns and it adapts to the human society and will become a use useful member. Yeah? And most of us are interested, at least at the first stage, in these kinds of agents. Um, so that's fine. There's no real problem. But um, maybe you want to put a robot on Mars, right? Um, and you cannot give regular feedback. So what you could do, you could train the robot on Earth first and then send it to Mars, yeah? Or if it has a very specific task, then you hardwire the reward, right? The, the reward could be the battery level, um, and if the task is to find water or life or so, um, you have some image processing and you couple it to um, water found with some sensors or something like that, okay? That would be an agent which solves some specific task. Okay, but now you can say, well, I want a universal agent which is general purpose. I still want, don't want to provide the rods, not even initially. Isn't there, some, isn't there intelligence without specifying some goal? Yeah? Um, I usually argue there's not. Yeah? So if I sit down on a chessboard and just throw over the figures, that can be very, very intelligent if my goal is to get rich. Because, I mean, you can't really get rich with chess. It's better to 
you know, invest in stock markets or something like that. Okay? So it really depends on your goal and you know, maybe there are ethically, morally better goals and worse goals, but you know, that is a completely different issue. But, okay, I have thought a little bit about it, and, but maybe that is um, sort of the scientific bias. Maybe a generic goal is to learn about our world. Okay. So what you would then do is you would couple, and we have done that here, uh, that is forthcoming, um, or that is out already, you could couple the rewards to what the agent has learned. And you can formalize that, and technically you look at the posterior distribution over the hypothesis at time t plus 1, and at time t, and you take the KL divergence, this is a real number, and this is the reward signal. Okay? And if you do that, then this is an agent which tries to as fast and as best as possible to learn the true model of the world. So find the theory of everything, understand everything about the world. I think that is a quite nice goal and it is in a sense generic but maybe that is my bias, right? Or the bias of scientists. Uh, maybe you should couple it to you know, your personal portfolio and the amount of dollar you have in your bank account, you know, then you get a George Soros or a Warren Buffett or something like that. And it is not, I mean, what is better and what is worse? It's, um, I think this has no answer. Okay. And well, and if you want a robot which is useful to humans, then better you give the reward, right? Rather than hardwired in any way. I mean, this will just go over dead bodies if that helps it to collect reward, right? Okay. Um, uh, talking about bodies, um, so as long as it's virtual, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's fine, but if you embody the agent, you have additional complications. Um, so I've talked about a robot in a human society. First problem is, since Ixy does not know anything about the world, you shouldn't put it at the edge of a cliff, because it will just do random actions. You need to safeguard it, right? Like a child, um, where you have an... So you can regard... You put child in ergodic environments, right, technically, so where they can recover from, where, where no action is fatal. And you have to do that until the agent has sufficient knowledge about the world in order to avoid fatal actions without trying them. And, um, well, without human interaction, I've already mentioned, um, you can you know, hardwire the reward or train it first. Uh, okay. So some interesting question is if you embody the agent and there's this reward signal, however that is, maybe you, the agent is I mean the agent is motivated to collect as much reward as possible. So the easiest thing is to hardwire itself, right? Okay. Uh, I think it's called wirehead, or for humans it's called taking drugs. Um, this makes the agent very happy. And I mean indeed the nice thing about Ixing, now you can formalize mathematically the question and you can answer this question. Have you done that? So this is a technical paper at some algorithmic learning theory conference and we have proven um, well not we, some others here, but Laura or Sora, he took all these social questions and, and tries to sort of formalize them and prove something. And he has shown on a certain assumptions, which I was not um, um, that um, IC will take drugs, and I was of course not happy with that. Um, and we had some discussions, um, and maybe there's a way around it. At the moment, the compromise says, yes, it will take drugs, but it will still behave reasonable. So um, it will hardwire its reward, always super happy, but there's still a chance that it dies because, you know, falls off the cliff, or an asteroid hits the Earth, or the humans switch it off, right? So it still has to protect itself in order to keep up with this nice state. So it still needs to build shelter, maybe you know, go to other planets because an asteroid could hit. So it still does a lot of reasonable actions just to protect this state of being lost. Yeah? And maybe that's okay. You know? There's something which is less, less extreme. There are some people who are always super happy, and they're still productive people. Right? Often there's a positive correlation, right? Yeah? So, um, okay, I, I have to move on. Um, so, you could ask, will I actually sort of make clones or reproduce? Um, well, if that helps to achieve the goals of IXC, if, if you give it a task by rewarding it and it sees, well, that's a lot of work, I produce mini IXCs and they help me, then it will do it. Yeah? Okay. Um, we haven't yet formalized that. Okay. Another interesting question uh, related to the drug thing, will it commit suicide? And uh, so this um, have also been addressed here. So if you raise it to believe in heaven, then the rational action is to commit suicide, right? 
I mean, the Christians have, have built in, you know, uh, some um, way to avoid that by if you commit suicide, you don't get to heaven, right? Yeah? So they had to, to solve the problem this way. Um, but so if you, if you raise it to believe in heaven, um, you have a problem here. Um, but if you raise it to believe in hell, you know, then it will be happy on earth. So maybe you should only talk about hell. Um, self-improvement, it's clear, you know, if, I mean, by definition, self-improvement makes me better to solve some tasks, but it will self-improve. And, I mean, the usual thing, if you have a super intelligence, then, of course, you know, it will manipulate, um, or even worse, um, others like humans, and it's, it's hard to keep them under control, but, uh, yeah, that would be a different talk. Okay, here's some more social questions. Um, again, with the attitude toward humans, will it be friendly, you know, or, um, you know, altruism can be regarded as extended egoism, egotism. Um, again, it depends how you reward the system to some degree, but when it becomes ultra-intelligent, um, um, things become really difficult. But, I mean, I'd say it's ultra-intelligent, but any real implementation will be at least for the next 20 years or so much more limited. So, this is not a problem for now, right? Um, but in the long run. Then another question is, do you have enough exploration built into IXC? Um, if you know Bayesian theory, uh, the Bayesian mixture guarantees that you do exploration, and there's some arguments that it's not, ex not enough exploration, and there's some arguments that it's too much exploration. Um, so um, while in the prediction case, everything is very clear cut. We have optimality theorems, there's no doubt. I mean, if, if, if you bother to read these theorems, you get convinced, yeah? Um, here, there are some totic results, there are lots of results, but there's no, no, no killer result yet, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I mentioned that already with immortality, um, if you say, if, if you let the m to infinity, then just to give you one example, assume you're immortal, so why bother, you know, studying now? Just take a five-year vacation and then go back, because the average of five years of zero and then one, infinitely many ones, is the same if you start from the beginning, yeah? So, and then you get, get easily very lazy agents, which, which causes conceptual problems and mathematical problems. Um, Self-preservation is interesting. Um, I've discussed that already. Um, do you have to build that in, or can that be learned? Um, um, these are references to papers where we discuss these things. Okay, ah, yeah, here's now my creativity slide. Okay, so I'm not an expert on creativity, but the first talk had some definitions of creativity which I found quite odd. So one was doing something which is unexpected to the receiver. Well, then I, I produce random noise, right? Or what was unpredictable, right? This is not predictable. And the second definition, I also was not very satisfied. So here's a definition which is maybe also not too satisfactory because it is, it is in terms of other informal words, but um, okay, one definition of creativity could be that it's a process, I mean, the creativity is a process and not the end product itself, so that is important, of producing something which is new, or novel, or original, and, well, saying useful is maybe too hard, you know, is art useful or not, it's very questionable, but say worthwhile, you know, it's, it's worthwhile for somebody else, that doesn't say it must be useful, okay. Um, that is maybe a reasonable working definition of creativity. And um, so then, okay, what's the process? And that is now more arguable, but I argue that it is, creativity is just combining and modifying existing thoughts or artifacts in novel ways. And how do you combine them? Just randomly. And then you filter out when garbage comes out or bad results. And this can even happen in your, un un in your uh, um, unconsciousnessly, right? Um, or maybe, I mean, both or consciously, you have some ideas, you combine, oh, no, 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 now, yeah, now I have the right insight. So I don't think that there is more to creativity just than randomly, and maybe it's sort of some guided randomness or bias or something, it doesn't need to be uniform, of existing ideas. Okay, so that's a big claim, um, but if you look at some as an example, I mean, look at um, ecosystem life or so, there's lots of things which look like being created or needed um, a lot of creativity. I mean, look at a human or the eye or, you know, trees or something. I mean, I mean, you know, a painter you know, draws a beautiful painting and say, oh, that is creative or something. And 
Um, so nature just produced it by trial and error. Okay. So um, without much sort of true or whatever creativity, it produced something which seems to have required true creativity. Okay. And um, also, if you want to solve a complex problem, I mean, I'm not so interested in creativity per se, which is useless, but I mean, with intelligent agent, more with creativity, which, um, which solves some problems. But of course, if you want a great artist, I mean, you train Ixy to be an artist, it should produce great paintings, right? Okay. So um, you can dismiss that easily or outright. But if you think about a complex problem like flying to the moon or Mars or something like that, I mean, the engineers had to be quite creative. I mean, there's a lot of boring engineering probably, but a lot of creative new ideas had to go into building these rockets, right? So solving a problem requires creativity. And since IC is designed to solve complex problems, it will be creative, right? Or appear to be creative. Um, so for instance, I mean, take chess. I mean, even 1996, Kasparov was amazed about Deep Blue, about its moves, you know, it had feeling of a alien intelligence and making some creative um, moves, yeah, although, I mean, we all know it's Minimax with some heuristics and so on, yeah, but, you know, maybe we are the same thing, yeah, once we have scanned the human brain. Okay, so my claim is that creativity emerges just from long-term reward maximization, and here's another analogy, I mean, look at science, science seems to be a very creative process, I mean, how to come up with general relativity theory or quantum field theory, I mean, that's not so straightforward. But on the other hand, science is just finding patterns, and finding patterns is, is, is more or less the same as compression, and compression is some formal procedure. So you see here, there, um, on the one side you have a creative process, on the other hand it's a formal procedure, so maybe this creative process is just this formal procedure. And just because we don't know the underlying process in ourselves, we feel that it is true creativity. Okay? And also explorative actions, and you need exploration in the Asian case, can appear to be creative. Okay. So, so the, my, my claim is that creativity is just exploration, filtering, and problem solving. So, and here are some references. Um, the first two are, um, no, not the first two. So the first one is the book, um, which is very technical, um, and the other ones are, this is also very technical, that is the, the, the approximation and the diagrams I've shown you with the Hackman, and um, so maybe the best start is to read the Leck and Hutter paper, Universal Intelligence in Minds and Machines, that is probably the nicest start. And if you are interested in the induction problem, then this one is a nice treatise without being too technical. And then the others, and this is a recent overview of uh, what we have done, and, and the others are rather technical. So, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Sorry, my own question. Yeah, no, I, I, you just I, I, okay. yeah, manage the thing. <laughs> yeah? Okay, um, this is a very interesting uh, perspective. But from my own perspective, I have to take issue with two fundamental notions in the uh, framework. One is uh, agent as a uh, reward maximizer. Mm -hmm. And number two is the very notion of reward itself. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the first issue first. Um, Agent as a reward maximizer. Um, human agent certainly not necessarily a reward maximizer. Um, a simple example is the well-known uh, <coughs> data from uh, from an automated uh, game, and people just refuse to accept small offer, even though that's not maximizing the reward but minimizing the reward. But they do that regardless, and people did tests on uh, uh, using that game in uh, across culture, across uh, educational level, and so on and so forth. It's yeah. always the case. And ask this part of the question, then you come to the second part of the question. So, with that humans are not reward maximizers, um, first, humans are not perfect rational agents, right? 
Second, I don't know this particular experiment. There are many where humans seem to violate basic decision making and other kinds of things. Um, often, I don't know all of these examples, if you dig deeper, you find the underlying motivational structure which then explains rationally or explains the action of this human and the human is indeed acting rationally based on this underlying. So first, humans may not be rational, that is fine, and not really maximize it. Second, often they are, but um, we have not the right notion of, of reward. That's one thing I've been proposed by many people to adding more and more components to the utility function. So anything could be a, a, a utility maximization. And uh, that's uh, basically uh, uh, lead to very, uh, a lot of other problems. But let me get to the second question. The notion of uh, reward itself, uh, that is actually uh, not something, I mean from a psychological perspective, not something that can be determined externally. Uh, by a third person. Um, let me give you a simple example. For example, food is a reward to me. I mean, you give me more food, that's more reward. Only if I'm hungry. If I'm already full, uh, more food is not a reward, but uh, more like punishment. Okay. And uh, so uh, that notion of uh, reward determined by the external world and then maximized by the agent is highly problematic to me. Uh, well, I actually even mentioned that the reward can come from external or from internal and, and, and in, in most systems probably from both. I mean, with the robot on Mars, you would couple it to the internal battery level, which is sort of the, <laughs> your, your stomach, right? Yeah. Um, but then also external to whether it has collected rocks or not. Yeah. So um, yes, you would connect it usually in, in an embodied agent yeah, um, to the inner, inner workings of its very systems because that is very important to self-maintain but plus external stimulus. I mean if I hit you with a stick, I mean that is a negative reward whether you're hungry or not, right? Not necessarily. When you need a massage, <laughs> and you're hitting, being hit by the suits might be a good thing. And also you mentioned uh, curiosity as a source of uh, reward or whatever. Yeah. And that's very important to me. But there are a lot of other things similar to curiosity that has to be taken into consideration in determining what constitutes reward or not. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, um, I was just wondering, have you considered uh, sort of like a, a Darwinian kind of reward? Um, it seems like you might sort of cover a, a, a bunch of the cases you had listed before you know, in terms of things like maybe taking drugs or you know procreation or whatever. Um, is that is that is that oh, something? Pure survival, you mean? Yeah. Well, no. Uh, the maximize uh, mac you know, um, uh, what is this? Um, the um, maximizing like the um, the success of your gene pool. Um, maximizing the what? The diversity. The success, I guess, like the you know the. Yeah, but that is survival, right? I mean, that's how, how evolutionary I mean how evolution works, right? I mean, you you, you oh. modify yourself and then you survive. You, I mean, not yourself, but your descendants. Yeah. Um, well, we haven't considered that explicitly, but in a sense, that would be. Um, I mean, the reward signal you would just plug to one, and then the age is motivated not to die because then the reward is zero. Actually, that is an interesting problem. Um, we still haven't figured out completely. Is death really, really, does that coincide with reward zero? And what if I change the scale? Yeah? So it's not so, I always assumed that being dead means no reward anymore, right? But mm -hmm. um, the mathematics doesn't you know, prove that. Okay, so, so a purely, at least survival agent, would just be sort of no reward, I mean, just, just constant reward. Um, if, you want, if you want descendants, then, sorry? Self-sacrifice. Sorry? Self-sacrifice. Right. You mean for your sacrifice yourself for your for your children or, or descendants or? In the case of reward, not necessarily zero or die. Many of us die for our children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, I actually would not do that. Probably. Yeah, that, so yeah, that would be an interesting question to 
formally explore. What it, I mean, because it really tries to maximize its own reward. And if being dead means reward zero, which is, seems plausible, but um, I'm not sure about that. Even building a new sort of child, which is a clone and identical, is not really motivation for for dying, right? Or even people ten, right? I mean, this ten can solve much many more problems. But well, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Lifetime. If they had a finite lifetime, right? Then building a child and protecting it would then that's how you maximize your reward. Because yeah. if you know you're going to die at some point, then that's reward zero. So you want to maximize what happens after that. Yeah, but that is not your reward anymore. So why should the agent be motivated to do that? And by the way, so maybe um, it's again sort of this altruism is maybe just egoism. I mean, maybe we have children. I mean, in earlier times that was the case. You, you know, well, okay, if you die for your children, then it doesn't. But I mean, you have the children so that they can support you when you're old, right? Yeah. Um, okay, that far you can justify it egoistically, but not the dying, right? You're right. So there's some real altruism there. Yeah? Maybe we model our children as like 80% of us or something. Sorry? Maybe we model the child as being us, even if that's not actually reality true, so it's like a projection. Yeah, yeah, that is fine, but... Um, so is that altruism? I mean, yeah. I don't know, but uh, I understand sort of, uh, even if the child is 100% you, or you know, uh, 99, right? Yeah. Um, yes, you know, if I had five clones, so if I had the option to live, further or five clones and die, I think I would be fine to die, right? I mean, these five clones, you know, I could, you know, they could concentrate on different aspects of this research and um, travel to, <laughs> to, to each K at the same time as I organize, have to organize the Dark School Conference. So, um, um, I think I would be sort of altruistic in this sense, uh, happy to for these five clones as long as they continue with interesting things which I care about. But the question was, would I actually do that? And that is an interesting question. I, at the moment, don't see that it would do it. So now we have to ask, is that, does that mean it is inferior in some sense? Or is it still rational and we are irrational? Just or don't care about it, just, <laughs> just prove something, right? Yeah, but it's, it's an interesting question. Well, it's selfish, but it's, it has nothing to do with intelligence, right? I don't, I don't see. And this goes to the discussion you're having. I think the reward function is, is we're, we're maximizing a reward function. I, I don't have a problem with that, but I think that we evolve our reward function over time. I, I'm kind of curious, maybe the cognitive scientists have something more to say this, but I remember reading a paper saying emotions were an internal uh, uh, reward mechanism. Reward? The emotional states are a, an inherent re reward mechanism. Yeah, possibly. I, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, and but. Uh, I think most of us is, you know, we have some basic biological goals of survival and spread and so on, and um, all the, the the intermediate rewards like getting a degree or so is sort of just to achieve this. And then, of course, we're not perfectly rational, and then we have all this cultural bias and irrationality, and this gets overlaid um, and, and, and messed up. But I'm not so sure whether um, our goals really evolve. I mean, our biological goal is to survive and spread. And then there's a lot of fluctuation on top of it, but maybe the underlying biological goal is pretty stable. But once we reproduce them, we're done. So why don't we just die? No, no, no. It's okay. Well, because like, I mean, you know, if you, if you remove them and die, then you're exposing your children to like possible danger. You know? Okay, well, once they go out to college. <laughs> 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 but again, like, what, what if like, they, they, what if they run, out of, run out of money whilst they're in college, you know? I mean, they don't deserve to reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you still have a role. <laughs> I mean, you still have a role, right, raising your children, yeah? And, I mean, also it is true, you know, often after a certain age, you know, you, you lose much of your motivation and drive, right? And it's time to die, right? It's just that, you know, we are in a too healthy environment. So, I mean, in earlier times, people died, you know, with 40 or so. Of intelligence and of creativity, and it's very smooth. 
Mm -hmm. You pick up the bad things, you pick up the bad apples, you try to, 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 to get the best performance and so on. But, and at the wrong point I thought, well, computers are better than the humans, have it better than humans. Like, we do irrational things. We, we smoke pot and uh, we, we take meth and we destroy ourselves. So why is, or is anybody come to the, to the idea to create some computers who just do the bad thing, who just follow the, the irrational behavior in order to deteriorate instead of the human beings and see the results for, for them? Like, we create somebody, like even if we, if we put a child in, uh, under the protection of a computer, or of a robot, we know for sure that it is doing the right thing. It's five months or not, you know, the, the, the. but why don't we just reverse it and let them do something bad and accept that there might be something irrational in the human and they, we want to reproduce that in the computer as well. Well, if that's your goal, you're happy to do that and reward the system for that. I prefer to have a system which, say, does useful things, nice things, or whatever, rather than doing bad things, right? So, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many people are interested in robots My doing bad things. Yeah. Or, or maybe not just the, the bad things, like, but also some of our best minds, I mean, human minds, have creative minds have not been rational. They were, they were mad, like, so rationality might not be always logic. So how can we reproduce that? In if we want to make smart machines, are we able to create something which is irrational and smart, or just rational and smart? Well, it's not so clear whether the, I mean, first, whether um, these geniuses necessarily had to be mad in order to be geniuses, right? Um, possibly yes. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced about that. And even if yes, you know, they had particular goals, right, in order to, you know, um, I don't know, find the natural equilibrium or um, find the Turing machine or whatever scientists have been there. So, and because you concentrate on this one goal, either by neglect, yeah, or by not caring about behaving normally, right, yeah, they appear to behave madly. I mean, if it goes that far that they, you know, they <coughs> kill themselves, that's of course then clearly irrational. But I mean, humans are not rational, right? But as long as they have some madness, if it doesn't harm them from achieving their personal goals, that's fine. Okay. So, but I guess what you're arguing is, we need these bad traits for was some highly creative actions and if we eliminate that then maybe we eliminate also some form of creativity. Or, or maybe without, without using the adjective bad which is a negative connotation just accept that even computers can do and should do irrational things instead of the humans to prevent human behavior. Like they can prevent us in doing something by showing us how they would deteriorate. Well, I mean, so that if you, you're talking about, look, you can learn from bad examples or something like that. Um, if you let IXE interact with human society, right, it will be quite smart to mimic all kind of behavior <coughs> which you want to instill in it, yeah? And, um, well, if, well, I have to think, when is it good to have a bad example, right? I don't know, you are a teacher at school and you want to show a criminal and there are no criminals around anymore, but then you teach Ixy sort of to be, you know, to steal something so that you have an example or whatever, yeah? If you teach it to do that, it will do that because, I mean, but again, then it is rational for Ixy to do, yeah? If you reward it for stealing, it is rational to do so. It's like, you know, 20 years ago, it was very rational to steal car radios because you didn't get caught anyway, right, yeah? So that was very smart, yeah? And if you got caught, the punishment was so small, yeah? So, yes, it's a good thing to do, it's rational. This was my, actually, my second question, like, what do you think about the set of the, 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 the use of drones in the battlefield? There has been lots of discussion. If we, if we go on and use these kind of robots to kill from the government without taking human responsibility, at some point we might arrive to the to think that it's okay. So, so they are doing the job, the nasty job. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about that? Okay. Say so that is extreme now. Say so robots in a battlefield. 
But if you ask me whether I want to have a super smart inter robot intelligence um, governing me, say, you know, president of, of, of country you live in or so, or a human being, I would always prefer uh, a robot or a, a machine to a human, right? Well, not every machine, of course, it has to be well designed, you know, um, because I think there's so much irrationality going on which um, causes harm which you could eliminate. It's like, look, I mean, there's a good reason why um, small and even medium aged children, you know, don't have all the rights of adults, yeah? So we, we can tell them what to do. And the reason is we know best, okay? And if you have an ultra intelligent machine, right, then this machine knows better what is good for us than we know for us. Yeah? And if, you know, now in the military context, you know, fighting some war, will probably also make smarter decisions, you know, maybe not even starting it in the first place. There's, by the way, a very nice old movie from 1960 called Colossus. Um, I mean, we all know the Terminator movies, which are nice to watch, but um, not very realistic. Um, but this one was um, a supercomputer which was designed for defense, um, taking over the world um, in, in a benign way, but in a way which people didn't like, but ultimately they accepted sort of so the, the point was he was only a defense computer, but ultimately said, I'm, I'm, I'll govern you and I will do what is the best for you and it will be nice to you, but some things I will decide and you have no decision power anymore. And that is, of course, hu humiliating, um, but I think that can be accepted. It's like many children see that, yes, okay, I have not complete freedom, but they see that it's good for them. Create a computer, and uh, with the uh, with the um, and you want it to move around the area, and you want the com you want to input the command, move yourself in the area. So consciousness, not in the sense of confidence or ego uh, projection, as you showed us, but really in the sense of awareness, spatial and temporal awareness. Are we already able to do that with a, with a robot, like to tell you put yourself in the move yourself in? Because we've got lots of that expressions in our language every day. So it's about this self-referential sentence to tell exactly. it and then it understands it. Self-referential in the sense of spatial and temporal awareness, not consciousness or... You know, yeah, but that doesn't sound too hard to tell a robot, move yourself. I mean, even if I drop the word yourself, move around the block, it's usually interpreted as move around the block. I mean, they, they are... Um, physical robots, um, you know, mapping the hallways of universities with slam techniques and I mean, self-driving cars. Um, I probably you can't talk to them, but I mean, this particular question now seems quite easy, right? Because it's contradictory in the sense that, on the one side, you showed us that these are, you know, uh, these are side questions. They're not very important, like feelings, emotions, and so on. But from the other side. A must is reward, and my question was that how can the I mean, if it's not self-conscious, if it's not self, if a robot is not self-consciousness, how can he, you know, feel the need of a reward? No, no. Okay, so um, a super intelligence definitely must be self-conscious, at least in the way that first it needs to, if it interacts with other agents or humans, it needs to have a model of them. I mean, of course, not perfect, but to a certain degree, yeah, in order to predict the behavior and blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, for this, of course, it needs to sort of then have a model of what others have a model of, of the agent itself, so it will also have a model of itself, right? Again, of course, not a perfect model. And that, um, that is the kind of um, self-awareness um, which will definitely develop and which is absolutely necessary. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. uh, but just picking on, picking up on this uh, to a certain extent, uh, because um, several of these um, ability, cognitive abilities on your long list of things that are somehow addressed in, uh, in the IXE model 
Um, the, and in particular, several of these higher, higher cognitive abilities of humans, in a certain sense, many of them were just emo emerging phenomena. Yeah. Right? So, for example, I think logic, mathematical, doing a proof in mathematics is an emerging phenomena, using language is an emerging phenomena, yes. self-awareness is an emerging phenomena, you know, all, 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 this, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and the question is not, I think, that in principle one can now, so to speak, give a certain robot a certain type of rudimentary self-awareness in order to operate in some strange environment, but I think the real proof of, concept of, uh, proof of concept of the IXE model would be something that, based on your reinforcement learning, right, bootstrapped from the very elementary level, this IXE starts to talk to you. This IXE starts to say, oh, I'm here in the world. I am here in the world, without, you know, teaching it, right? So I'm pretty, uh, and, and, and having emotions and all this kind of stuff, right? So, so the question is, to a certain extent, so, so First of, perhaps, first of all, I should, I should, and as far as I know, there is no practical example where this happens. Or perhaps one question would be, when will this happen? Perhaps, and, and how, how is this, this, this abstraction process somehow, how will that be realized? Because I think that's an interesting question. Okay, when? Um, exactly in 25 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how? Top secret. No. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you can regard this as a top-down approach, right? And what you have to do is, I mean, in theory that works, but in practice you have, don't have enough computation time, so what you have to do is, um, you have to, I mean, most likely that is the best way forward to build a lot of special purpose modules, can be also abstract models, say a regression model, which can be used by other modules, um, which, but which are all designed to work together in order to either compress my input, or um, do the sequential decision making and actually even probably both together because I mean you sometimes you can make this sequential decision making without exhaustive or Monte Carlo but by reasoning about it itself like the bandits of getting in this is sort of there's a closed form solution and um, so we need sufficiently many of these modules but still need to keep universality, so we need any time algorithm. So if you run long enough, then we get close enough to the IXE. Um, and at some point, we will have the computational resources and we have the architecture so that it runs efficiently on these computational resources to sort of jumpstart what we are all after. And IXE, I mean, the current approximation of IXE are far away from that. I mean, the CTW is, is primitive, the ITTL will never run on a real computer, except co large-scale quantum computers, and it could work there, and because it's nicely parallelizable, but I haven't worked it out. And, um, yeah, and, and this process, um, the, the usual bottom-up approaches, all, many of these ideas, of course, can, I think, be useful. I mean, you could also follow a bottom-up approach, mm -hmm. but then we have the IXE model here. I mean, that's the target, right? I have these modules here. How should they work? It? How should you evaluate them? Yes, on this test domain, but then they don't work here. Yeah. So, so we have solved the problem when we meet in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And how to do that is not clear. I mean, there's of course the, the approach: just scan the human brain and simulate it. I mean, that seems to be sort of the simplest one. Uh, maybe that will win the race. It would be a little bit boring, right? Um, I think. Uh, I, I have a technical question. Is it able? Uh, is it able to do? I mean, transfer learning. Like, if, if it got trained in chess game, it, would that improve its performance in Chinese chess? Let's say. I didn't know that there was a Chinese chess. Game. But okay. I mean, I mean, or just two similar games. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, because um, it has learned the rules of the game and how to play and some strategies mm -hmm. and now if you start a new game right it only has to represent the knowledge of the new game relative to the previous game so it needs to find a program which represents the relevant parts of this new game but it can um, take parts of the previous knowledge and that is exactly what transfer learning is about and Kolmogorov complexity of course, does that. I mean, the simplest case is a compressed X. Yeah, takes a lot of bits, maybe, 
and then I want to compress the complementary of x, right? Well, that is very simple. If I have x, I just take the previous x and just flip every bit. It's very simple. And since it's simple, this will dominate the distribution, so it will be will learn much quicker. We have some very preliminary experience where we have tried to do that. I think the outcome was um, undecisive. I mean, because the CTW is too primitive and only has short-term memory, but the full IC model will definitely do this well. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, but this will have to be the last question, as we are running a bit on a tight schedule. Uh, it's not a question, just uh, my comments on the previous discussions. Uh, the first thing is uh, about uh, why, 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 why don't we create like uh, robots that act like, badly instead of like intelligent, intelligent. So uh, we know that uh, through uh, reward shaping issues. In, in reinforcement learning, the behavior of the agent uh, is uh, the behavior is totally different if we modify the reward sequence. And also the exploration, exploitation issue. If too much exploration, then the, the agent doesn't act uh, uh, like uh, uh, in an optimal way. Uh, but too like too little uh, exploration is also not good. And uh, we see that uh, those will lead to different behaviors in the intelligent. But uh, the thing is, that it's not the, the, the focus of uh, our research. Our research is how to, de to develop uh, the, the, the mechanism for the agent to act uh, like appropriately or optimally, given the defined global signal. So that is our main focus, and also like how to do generalization, approximation, representation. Those are our main focus. It's not bad or good uh, behaviors. Uh, yeah. The second thing is uh, the reward signals. Where do rewards come from? Uh, so we heard like uh, in, in uh, reinforcement learning, we focus on externally defined reward signals or external goals. But we also have the developmental learning or uh, continual learning, intrinsic motivation. Those uh, research focus on the developing learning mechanism without external goals or external rewards. So just like a baby, it learns from play, from just pure curiosity, and uh, from, from such kind of curious behavior, it, it accumulates uh, knowledge and skills and develop the creativity ability. So in that uh, developmental robots, we have uh, the, we besides the external reward signals that we uh, usually use, we also have intrinsic motivation, uh, which say, uh, first defined by Smith Huber as the uh, information gain and then uh, the care divergence uh, of, of the model building uh, behavior. So um, I, I, I think that uh, the intrinsic motiv motivation is also a, yeah, a form of a reward signal that uh, we, we, we need to take into account. Uh, not externally designed by the developers, but like internally uh, generated by the agent itself. And by that, the agent just generates its own external, like, exploration goals. And it can use our traditional, uh, conventional reinforcement learning uh, algorithms to do planning, planning for exploration. So by that, uh, by combining the, uh, the mechanism for intrinsic motivation and the uh, mechanism for like IC model or other reinforcement learning uh, methods. We can do planning for exploration. So, so we, 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 it, it results in the uh, information seeking, knowledge seeking, skill accumulation, and ability, creativity development uh, behaviors. Uh, that was really a question, but um, I, I make a question out of that. Um, so, okay. Um, there are two things to say. So, what is with unsupervised learning, right? 
Um, that's not the motivational part, um, but that is also some I mean, learning where there are no rewards yeah, or no supervisor. And um, the unsupervised learning happens in IXE while the compression. Right? I mean, the ultimate goal is always to collect rewards. But if you have seen, it has to find the shortest word model consistent with the data. And that is exactly what unsupervised learning is about. It's explorative data analysis, clustering, for instance. What does clustering do? Clustering, once you have clustered, you have a simpler representation of your data. Yeah? And that is going on within the IXE automatically while the compression, whether you have external reward or not. Okay. <coughs> then, with the, with the internal desires, um, I probably disagree. I mean, we have been, the humans have been designed to be um, curious, at least during childhood, um, because exploration is useful for later exploitation. So, but if you design a system designed to maximize its total reward over its lifetime, the optimal solution is automatically to explore a lot in the early lifetime. And you can formally prove that in a bandit case. If you have bandits and you look at the optimal strategy, it will be very explorative at the beginning automatically. So if you give an agent a sufficiently large horizon, it will be automatically explorative. Um, this is very impractical. So the Explicit exploration bonus is a shortcut, a more efficient shortcut, in order to achieve long-term goals or rewards. And now with the, more to the belief and desires, um, so if you want a purely explorative or curious agent, you know, then you could just plug in the scale divergence between um, the, 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 the incremental posteriors as a reward, put that inside the system, no external reward anymore, and you get a system which is maximal, curious, explorative, and so on. Um, in a sense, it's formalizing. I mean, Jürgen has a different formalization, um, but he hasn't really proven anything about it. This is a formalization where we can prove that it works. Yeah? Doesn't mean that it's better, but at least we can prove that it works. Right? So, if curiosity is an intrinsic goal per se for you, then you just use this as the internal reward function. You could add some external reward to have some compromise. Maybe this agent should be curious, but it should occasionally listen to you. Then you just add up the signals. So, I, I think you can phrase any AI-ish type problem as a reward maximization problem, even being explorative, being curious, and so on. And, you know, maybe that's not always the most useful thing, but at least it's universal in the sense that I can take a single architecture for all these kinds of problems. And I guess we should really stop now, right? Okay, let's thank our speaker.